Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to the Robert and Francis Fullerton Museum of Art. Uh, I am so happy that you will all be joining us today for the next uh, Cocktails with the Collection. This has been a series that's been running um, this year that highlights different aspects of the RAFMA, Robert and Francis Fullerton Museum of Art collection. Um, and it's really been a lot of fun being an informal event where you guys get to interact and ask me questions too. So I do encourage you to you know, type questions into the chat even while I'm talking. I will hopefully be able to look up and read them out and answer them as I go. I want this to be, you know, to be able to respond to what you guys want to know about too. So feel free to ask questions at any time in the chat. And um, then towards the end, we can just move to question and answer also. Um, uh, next on the docket for the for RAFMA, uh, if you guys have kids between the ages of about six and 12, uh, in July, they are doing a Kids Discover Egypt series, um, which it teaches kids about ancient Egypt. And it's a fun and creative event where they get to learn about the past and then create art about ancient Egypt too. So definitely tell all your friends about that. It is July 12th through 15th, as Miranda just posted. So definitely if you have kids or grandkids or nieces or nephews that might, uh, might be interested, it's all virtual. So um, feel free to join in. Um, and then, yes, I guess I should introduce myself too. Uh, my name is Kate Liska. I am an associate professor and the Benson and Pamela Herrera Fellow of Egyptology here at California State um, University, San Bernardino. Uh, I am an Egyptologist and I've been going back and forth to Egypt since 1999, <laughs> many, many years at this point. Um, I love all things about ancient Egypt. Uh, I teach classes about ancient Egypt and I also run an archeological dig at Wadi Ohudi which is an ancient Egyptian amethyst mining area. Um, but I'm not talking about any of that tonight. I'm talking about scarabs because scarabs are awesome. Um, and I guess I should introduce the subject by saying this is cocktails with the collection. So I do urge you all to have a fine Rathma branded cocktail. Um, today I am suggesting the um, tequila sunrise. And the reason that I chose the tequila sunrise is because when you mix the orange juice with the grenadine, you get a mix of orange and red, which essentially simulates the sunrise. And scarabs are all about the sunrise. Um, here I'm substituting with uh, a red wine, uh, which is also a color of the sun. Um, but please, you know, partake if you would like. Um, okay, so let's talk about scarabs. Um, can you move to the slide, Diego, with the, the dung veal? Yes, thank you, perfect. So scarabs are dung beetles. They are just these little bugs that push around and eat dung, which is why they've been called dung beetles, right? Um, and it's fascinating because the ancient Egyptians take these really common insect that seems quite strange and turns this bug into one of the most important and meaningful symbols that underpins their religion and this entire idea around creation. So how does this crazy little bug get from one place to the other? Well, the answer is in the poop. <laughs> so dung beetles essentially push around balls of dung, as you can see this beetle doing right now, and they eat it, that's their food. Um, but dung beetles will also lay their larvae into balls as well. Um, in actuality, they lay their larvae into the more like apple-shaped, pear-shaped balls that you see on the bottom, but the ancient Egyptians probably didn't know that and the normal ones that they eat are just circular anyway. So they lay their larvae inside the dung, and then these little larvae beetles will, you know, as they grow, eat the dung, yum, 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 um, and grow bigger and grow bigger and grow bigger. And essentially when they're ready to be born, the dung ball breaks and they're alive. So the ancient Egyptians are probably looking at the circle, you know, the sphere, and it's the most worthless material in the world. It's poop, right? And out of this nothingness comes life. 
It's created out of absolutely nothing. And they're like, what in the world is this? And that idea of this creation out of nothing spurs on this idea of the dung beetle being the word hepper, which means to come into being, to, to be created, to come out of nothingness. Um, and this spins out on so many different ideas. So from the word hepper, they create the god Hepri, who is a god of the early morning sun. Um, and guess what else is a circle besides of all of dung? That's the sun in the sky too. So if you are being created every day, then this bug comes to be. So as you can see on the left-hand side, you have a little beetle on the papyrus and he's pushing a big ball over his head, right? This creative beetle ends up becoming an early form of the sun god, the sun in the morning when it's first starting to rise, when it's first being born. Can you move to the next slide, Diego? Yes, perfect. Um, and so we get this aspect of the sun coming together where the, the, the god of the sun in the morning, like the god by the name of Hepri, ends up being this early form of the sun. Now there are in fact some 92 versions of the sun according to the litany of Ray, <laughs> um, but the two or three main ones are the ones you see in the lower left corner here. The scarab beetle, which is the sun in the morning, the actual disc circle, which is Ray, the sun in the afternoon, and then the rammed headed god um, uh, Atum, which is the sun in the evening. So that is the three big forms of the sun and he ages by the day. Um, and so can you switch to the panel of gods, Diego? Thank you. So here at Rafma, we have this amazing panel of deities that came from a temple um, we're not sure which one, but it dates to the Ptolemaic period, and it basically has a line of different gods in it. And as you can see on the central image, notice how he has the circle on his head, and then also the heifer beetle inside of it. So this is definitely the god Hepri, who helps the sun be born every single morning. Um, and so as the sun is born every morning, it ages through the day as Ray, and then it becomes old at night as Atum. And then in the evening, it goes through the underworld, at which point it essentially has to travel through the underworld, almost dies every midnight, you know, in the sixth hour of night, and is then reborn again every day. So this cycle of the sun is immensely important to all things related to ancient Egyptian religion and world concepts. Um, because the sun essentially is born, dies, and is reborn every day. Plants, what do they do? They're born in the spring, they age in the fall, they die, and they're reborn the following year. So it just makes sense that humanity would do the same thing, right? We would be born with the help of Ray and all the other gods, we would age, we would die, we would be buried in the West, and then we would be reborn into the afterlife. So the Kepper beetle, the beetle of coming into existence, ends up having this fundamental significance created, connected to rebirth and creation. Um, feel free to type in any questions if you want. Chat's open, I can read most of it. Um, right, so fantastic. So now let's actually talk about a couple of the scarabs. Actually, Diego, can you move to the um, to the weighing of the heart scene? So many of you guys have probably seen this image before, but essentially the Egyptians believed that to get into the afterlife, your heart, which was the most important part of your body, needed to be weighed against the feather of truth, the feather of ma'at. Um, and the ancient Egyptians thought everything that you were, are, and ever will be is in your heart. They didn't know what the brain did. And so they, they attributed everything we know the brain does to the heart, that is your soul. And so this is a pivotal moment to be able to get into the afterlife. And um, it creates, it, it's the moment where you might be reborn too. So the ancient Egyptians, when they created their mummies, they wanted to make sure that everything within the mummy would essentially make sure that 
the deceased person got into the afterlife, that they would make sure that they would be able to get past this morality test. Even having a papyrus like this in your tomb isn't just a statement of what will happen, but it's almost an ensurement that it will happen too. So can we switch to the above camera now? Okay. So the ancient Egyptians had these amazing objects called, let's see if I can balance it properly, or no, I'll just do this. There we go. See, I, I'm with it. <laughs> okay. Had these amazing objects called heart scarabs. And heart scarabs are fairly large. They're probably about two or three inches by about an inch and a half. So you can see my hand there. Um, and these are always placed on top of the heart within a person's mummy. Um, now you might have heard that during the process of mummification, you know, different organs make the body rot. So they take out the stomach, the liver, the lungs, and the intestines, they mummify them separately and they put them in different jars. But the heart could not be separated from the body because that was your, that was your life. That was everything you were. So they would mummify the heart separately and then they would put it back in the body. And then they would place this very important scarab on top of the heart to basically guide the heart through these pivotal moments like the weighing of the heart to make sure that the heart didn't like, you know, step out of line and say the wrong thing. Um, and so these very large scarabs, which are, you know, almost, well, not quite the size of a real heart at all, but they would all have a magical spell on the back. And well, not all of them, but they're meant to have a magical spell on the back. And this spell, which you can see here, is spell 30B from the Book of the Dead. And this is essentially the heart scarab spell. You don't need to know the actual words. And almost all of them say the same exact thing. Um, so what these scarabs say, and there's different ver versions of them, but let me read to you briefly. It says, oh, my heart from my mother, my heart from my mother, my heart of my coming into being. Do not rise as witness against me. Okay, so do not rise as witness against me. What does that mean? It basically means don't tell them I was bad in life, right? Like <laughs> just, you know, lie for me a little bit. If I happen to have been morally bad, it's okay. We'll just get through this. But don't speak out of turn, right? Do not create opposition against me among the judges, right? Like he's in the, he's at the pivotal moment of being able to get in. So this spell is telling the heart to stay in line. Do not tip the scales, and that's a reference to the weighing of the heart scene. Do not tip the scales against me in the presence of the guardian of the balance. You are my ka, which is in my body. Do not tell lies about me in the presence of the great God. So this spell essentially makes sure that your heart passes the morality test, right? That you were a good, moral, balanced person in life. Um, and most of them have these spells on it, but this one at Rafma is fascinating. Um, as uh, Brian Kramer, the, the uh, curator, or sorry, the consulting Egyptologist at Rafma was looking at earlier today, um, it actually has that spell across most of it. But then the scribe who started writing this on, I don't know if you can see this, these lines aren't necessarily straight. They kind of like start tilting to the side. He starts writing at an angle. It wasn't wasn't the most pristinely laid out, right? Well, there's only about 75% of this spell written on this because he basically just ran out of room at the end of that time. But it's okay, you know? The, actually, heart scarabs do this all the time. They don't, they don't need the entire thing because they have enough of it on there to note that it will magically work, right? And so these heart scarabs really come into being in the New Kingdom, so something like 1500 BC, and they last for hundreds and hundreds of years. But the later ones don't even bother to write the actual spell on it. Or maybe they'll just put a couple of lines of the spell. Or maybe they'll have uh, a couple of lines of the spell in the person's name who owns it on it, right? And it's because the magic works the same regardless. Heart scarabs not only are large, but they're almost always um, made out of hard stone that is usually black or green. Um, and I'm not a geologist, so I don't know exactly what kind of stone this is, but it is in fact a hard black stone that's been well polished. So it is a perfect stone for this type of necessity. 
So why black or green? Black and green in ancient Egypt are the colors of um, creation. They're the colors of Osiris and rebirth. Um, and that is, again, based on the cycle, the cyclical worldview that's kind of based on the sun. But if you, you know, um, think about their plants, the way that planting works in Egypt is that the Nile floods every year. It's, on, it's underwater for about four months, then the water goes away, and then they have this really nutrient-rich black, black soil because it all came from the silt of the Nile. And they never had to fertilize up until they built the Aswan High Dam. <laughs> uh, and then out of this nutrient rich soil would grow these amazing green plants. So the black from the soil and the green from the plants are in fact the symbols of rebirth and of birth. And so it makes sense. The heart scares because this guy wants to be reborn in the afterlife is also made out of this very dark stone. Um, and later heart scarabs get a little smaller or they drop the spell altogether. Excuse me. Um, but any questions? Not yet. Okay, feel free to type questions at any time. Later on, starting in like the 25th dynasty, I'm just gonna see if I can move my whole thing. Yep, there we go, perfect. Um, later on, starting in about the 25th dynasty, they changed the heart scarab to these winged scarabs. In fact, we have two of them from Rathma. Oh, no, we'll just do one and then the other. Um, these winged scarabs basically do the same thing that the heart scarab does magically. Um, they sit on the heart and they tell the heart to pass through this moment of balance, this moment of weighing your heart properly. Um, and to make sure that the deceased then gets into the afterlife because of it. Um, at this point, they grow little wings. And that makes sense because wings are also a symbol of the sun and of um, how you move around in the sky and of protection. And so um, it's very common for scarabs to have wings eventually. Um, and yeah. Um, and these would have basically been like tied onto the mummy. At this point, they're made out of faience. So faience is basically the ancient Egyptian plastic, right? It is cheap to make, um, it's easy to make. It's essentially a mix of, you know, like sand quartz um, with some lime and some other stuff in it. So you get this like non-clay clay, right? You, you can form it into a ball, you can shove it into a mold and you can put it into a kiln and you can create whatever you want. So this is the type of thing that everybody had. Probably even lower class people would be able to have a piece or two of faience in their lives because of how inexpensive it is. Um, so, but the blue of the faience is also important. Um, blues and greens are very similar in Egypt. You can see this one's a slightly darker blue but basically it, it's the same type of symbolism as the green, also of creation and rebirth. These are a lot skinnier, um, and that's because they're actually being tied into the mummies at this point. The bottoms are not really decorated because nobody should have seen that. And the same is true for the wings. When you flip them over, the bottoms are just, you know, plain. Oh, there, ha. It focused, yes. <laughs> um, again, very just, you know, simple, plain faience. But you know these were tied into a mummy because of all the holes. Do you see that hole, 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 hole? That's how so you can stitch it directly in right above the heart and it doesn't actually fall off. Um, and it would have done the same thing. And it's the same thing with the slightly larger one here. You can see all the holes around it. Uh, again, a very skinny type of scarab with no decoration on the back. Um, and yet it would have functioned the same exact way, just a lot quicker and easier to make in that regard. Um, so that is the primary function of scarabs within a mummy. So can we switch to the coffin of Tadi user? 
Excellent. So whenever you guys get to come to RACMA, we have this very cool coffin of, thanks to Brian Kramer, a woman by the name of Todd User. Um, it happens to be in a coffin that calls her a man, but that's actually pretty common from this, this point in time, um, something like the 25th, 26th, 27th dynasty um, around the Asut, larger Asut Fayum region has this type of thing. So it makes sense. Anyway, so we have this very, very cool coffin um, and it has a history of its, of its own, but this would have been, you know, uh, upper middle class, lower, lower upper class type of person to be able to have had such an exquisite piece made for her. Um, and at this point, the coffins, the anthropoid coffins are created to kind of parallel how mummies are actually being created. So you have this giant broad collar that's going around her entire top piece. Um, but then also, can you zoom in on the central section? Perfect. Notice that symbol there in the middle, you know, right below the broad collar. What we have here is a scarab and it has little hands um, and it's pushing two balls. Of course, those balls are the sun. So it is essentially that central amulet now not just like tied into the mummy, but actually like on your coffin coffin. Um, so that it helps you be reborn in the afterlife. Um, and it's being surrounded by jackals, which are symbols of the necropolis uh, and protection in the afterlife. And then below, although you can't really see it in this image, but you can see the first four, it has about 12 different demons, quote unquote demons. Um, these are good demons, not bad demons, and they're actually protecting the deceased with knives from any other bad things that might happen. Um, if you guys go back in the archive, definitely check out Rafma's demonology conference from April. Uh, I highly recommend it. Talks all about good demons, but you see them on um, things like coffins frequently and then other types of things. Anyway, so not only do you have the scarab in the middle, but just noticing this, do you see the red and the blue horizontal lines coming out of it? Those are stylized wings. Um, so you are essentially getting that wing scarab motif, but here it's been stretched out across the coffin. Um, and at the same time, thank you, Miranda, that's the link to the Redeeming Demons that you should watch after this one's over. <laughs> but copy that link now. Anyway, so you have that um uh you have the wings coming out right that's creating that solar imagery and then at the same time the artist is using it as a register line for the jackals to stand on so it's a very interesting that you're taking this piece of the anatomy of your wing scarab and turning it into um you know part of the larger artistic creation at the same time so very cool Okay, so questions about wing scarabs, heart scarabs, scarabs in the afterlife. Feel free to shout them out, otherwise I will just keep going. Um, okay, so can we go back to the above camera? Perfect, okay. Scarabs are incredibly, incredibly important for the dead, for all the reasons that we just talked about. But the living want scarabs too, because they're awesome. Um, and so scarabs are one of the most common things, um, uh, one of the most common things that we see in jewelry. Um, I will answer that question later, I promise. Um, let me go on to this now, okay. So scarabs are, uh, Scarabs are very common in um, jewelry that the living wear also. And notice we have a lineup of scarabs here and the majority of them, except for this teeny tiny little one over here are made out of fans. So this is again, your very, very um, cheapest of ancient Egyptian materials that can be made quickly and easily. Um, and they are in fact made in molds and very cool, we actually have a scarab mold here at Rafma too. 
Um, if you can see, it is the reverse impression of a scarab that looks very much like the one just above it. You can tell there's the head, there's the little wings um, that actually create that type of image. And this is in fact clay from ancient Egypt. Um, and so what they would do is they would take this type of paste and they would lay it into the, the mold and then they'd put another mold on top of it and then they'd put it in the, in the kiln. Um, and they would fire it probably at about 800 degrees um, Celsius. So pretty hot, but actually most of the ovens could get that hot uh, if they really wanted them to. Um, and they probably would have had two molds on either, either side. I was actually looking at this. This is our winged scarab that I just showed you a minute ago, right? But if you look at the reverse impression of this winged scarab, although we're not always supposed to, do you see all these markings? Um, it almost looks like some sort of matting, almost like they had had a mold and then instead of having a flat mold on the top, they just kind of like threw maybe a, a reed mat on top of it. It actually almost looks like the same texture as my gloves, but it wouldn't have been modern gloves. Um, but that type of thing would have actually covered over the side. And to get the holes, it's pretty easy. You just put in a stick um, into that type of clay before you put it into the kiln and then the sticks fire out and you have holes. It works really well. <laughs> uh, okay, um, so, so they're made fairly simply, but scarabs are not only made out of fans. Scarabs are made out of any material and every material imaginable. Um, definitely of multiple colors. Um, Diego, could we move to the slide where you just have like, you know, 60 different scarabs of all different colors. I think it's towards the end of the thing. Sorry, I didn't cue that one up earlier. <laughs> uh, it'll come up. Yeah, perfect. So you notice on the left here, scarabs of every different type of stone, every different type of color. Some even have metal workings in them. The one in the middle is a ring. And so very often people would turn scarabs into rings. Um, they're very often made of semi-precious stones and they run the gamut of all the really cool colors. Um, and of course, most colors in Egypt uh, actually have different types of color symbolism in that. Um, and so, uh, you know, you always want to bring in, think about your color along with that particular image. So red would be, you know, the color of the sun, especially the sun in the morning, the sun rising. Um, uh, you know, and blues and greens are colors of rebirth, so they all kind of come together. Okay, great. Can we go back to the scarabs here too? Perfect. So we have this a lovely arrangement of scarabs from, um, from ancient Egypt. Uh, and I agree, scarabs do make awesome jewelry. And so did, that was one of the comments in the, in the chat over there. But um, a lot of people from like the 1700s, and 1800s uh, thought that they made awesome jewelry too. And, and in the Victorian age, people used to take ancient Egyptian scarabs and like train them into necklaces. Actually, Diego, I think I have a picture of that on one of them, if you see that, just like this massive necklace <laughs> made out of scarabs. So this is, obviously we're not going to do anything like this now, but this is two or 300 years ago. And so like that necklace in the middle has a lot of ancient Egyptian scarabs that would have been worn by a Victorian within this all new type of, you know, layout. Um, <laughs> so people did do a lot of interesting things. I know I, I used to work a lot with the um, uh, Princeton collection as well um, at their museum there. And they had a lot of cool scarabs and three of them were turned into men's tie pins actually. It was pretty simple to do. Um, because most scarabs have holes that go through them. So can we go back to the down spout now or the down camera? Awesome. So you notice that actually most scarabs have holes that go straight through. So they were in fact jewelry um, and they could be worn as ancient Egyptian necklaces. Um, as you saw in that earlier image, ancient Egyptian rings, a lot of people had them set into rings. Um, and they were basically any way you can decorate with them. Sometimes they would have them as bracelets, uh, girdles, anklets. Um, they went all out with scarabs and jewelry in any way possible because wearing these in um, life 
would have had that same type of symbolism in it, right? I mean, this is a very poignant symbol to be reborn, to have life, and, and those things all come together. So, so um, it's a symbol that the living want to have in their lives too, to, to be reborn. Um, and it's not just the tops of the scarabs that are important, um, although we will talk about these in a little bit. Um, but the bottoms of the scarabs give ample things to actually then have different types of messages on them. Let's do this one first. Yes. So I don't know if you can see that. Yep. You guys can all see that, right? Yes. Okay. Um, there on the back of the scarab, we have other emblematic hieroglyphs. And these hieroglyphs are other major ideas that people want to live by. You have the Nefer Ka symbol, you know, may your Ka be good, may your Ka be beautiful. Um, you also have the Ankh symbol or to live and life. Um, and so they are bringing the power of those symbols of beauty, of protection, of your Ka spirit and of life all on the back of your scarab of being uh, created as well. So let's see, Amira said, I wasn't referring to the ancient scarabs, you can get the motif made now. Uh, yes, I too would never want to abuse an ancient artifact. Um, 300 years ago, people did do that um, <laughs> as a means of art, but yes, um, nobody does that anymore and we do not condone that. So yes, and onks too, I agree. Um, but a lot of these give space for creation on the back. So that one has standard type of uh, goodwill hieroglyphs, right? Things that you want to happen, you want to live, you want to be beautiful, you want to be a happy life. So those are the types of hieroglyphs on that one. This one is a little harder to see. Maybe I can bring it a little closer um, here. Okay, I know it's a little hard to see, but it is a seated man holding a staff. And this is in fact a hieroglyph uh, for the Sah symbol. It's a little hard to see, but it basically is a symbol that means protection. So it is another type of um, emblematic, cool thing that you want. You want protection and you want this on the jewelry that you would wear. Um, I love this one. This one's really awesome because on the back of this one, you guys, can you guys see those? Those are two Tawasrit goddesses. And if you don't know Tawasrit, you should. She's awesome. She's a hippo. Um, and she is connected with, she's not just a hippo, she's a pregnant hippo, as you can see from her larger belly area, um, but she's connected with the protection of women and children. Um, and you see the little uh, hieroglyph in between her, uh, the two of them, that is the Nefer symbol. So it is again, beauty and perfection, um, but offset by these two Tawasret hippos, which are protection of children. So you can bring in all of these different types of ideas, which are fun. Um, this one is a little cool. It's a, again, a little hard to see, but it has a different type of motif on it. Ah, there we go. You can kind of see a jackal with four legs on the upper left. And then the jackal is striding over something, which I'm guessing is a dead body. Um, and then you have uh, two other hieroglyphs on the right side. Now this jackal striding over a dead body might seem weird, but it is in fact a symbol that we get around necropolis a lot. Um, a symbol of, I need to stop moving, a symbol of Anubis um, or Anubis and protection. So it's one of those things that uh, the god Anubis who protects cemeteries specifically and helps with the mummification might actually bring in as a means of protection. So even though it looks a little weird, if you go the cemetery route, it, it too is good types of things that people want. Although I'm not sure I want a jackal trampling on me, but, <laughs> but still, um, right. And then this last one I love, this one, if you can see the oval in the moon. Oh, wait, we have a question. Is the jackal the one who helps transport the soul? Yes. 
Yes and no. So if you go back to like the weighing of the heart scene, uh, sometimes it's Horus, but sometimes it's Anubis who bring the deceased in after the weighing of the heart. So I don't know if we can go back to the weighing of the heart scene. Okay, so you see the jackal god there. He's kneeling he's watching it so he's part of this process and then of course it's not in this image um yes and anubis does oversee mummification too but in the next scene over either the two people on the left who have died um get presented before osiris and sometimes they're presented by horus sometimes they're presented by anubis they're all good gods and so they are all they all have aspects and Anubis in particular does oversee mummification and protects um, cemeteries. So it makes sense. Okay, overhead camera again. Okay, so this one is very cool. Um, you can see the oval that is offset by two feathers. And so the two feathers are shoe feathers. They're basic feathers of protection. Um, and the oval is a king's cartouche. I can't, okay, there we go. The oval is a king's cartouche. So the king always gets his name written inside of a cartouche. Um, and in this particular case, it has the name of Menmot Ray, which is in fact um, Seti I, one of the second king of the 19th dynasty, who's a very important king of Egyptian history after the the Amarna period, so something like 1200 BC. Um, and so he has his name on the scarab. And I would hazard to guess, although might not publish this yet, but I would hazard to guess that this scarab was probably actually made during or shortly after his reign. Um, and, and these types of scarabs, if they're being made during a king's reign and has a king's name on it, could have been passed out to people. Like maybe they were made for an, a large event or a large fast festival and almost like doled out as, as party favors. Although other Egyptologists don't like that idea, I do, um, but it's okay. Um, and so like normal people would have had actually something with the king's name on it. Now I do know that a lot of other kings, especially Tutmosis III um, and, um, uh, Tutmosis III would in fact have their names written on scarabs not just while they, they were alive but for thousands of years later. So Tutmosis III was considered like this god king. He was like the Napoleon of Egypt that essentially invented colonial imperialism in the world, right? Like thanks Tutmosis III, you got that. Um, anyway, his name appears on scarabs not just during his reign but for the next thousands of years for the next thousand years and they're found all over the ancient international world too um and that's because he was kind of turned into a god after he died well all kings are gods after he died but he was special right he like invented colonialism so thanks um so he's on scarabs for a lot longer than that study the first however and i would need to double check this i'm pretty sure that just during his reign and after his reign are really the only times that his name comes into play in that case. Um, yes, and there was a question about the scarab. So underneath the Menmot Ray, you do have this symbol that looks like a basket with tassels coming off of it. And that is the symbol of gold. So very often it is connected with the golden Horus name, but this isn't his golden Horus name. Um, or sometimes it's just put into uh, different types of scarabs as decorative motifs. It, it means gold, but it's also connected with the uh, royal titulary as well. So that's a pretty common thing to see um, a cartouche of a king sitting on. Right. Okay, so those are the backsides. I didn't show you these three because um, their backsides are not preserved to the same type of quality. In fact, this little teeny glass one who is super cute and shiny um, doesn't seem to have anything on the back at all. It just seems to be flat. Glass was brought into Egypt around the reign of Tutmosis III. It was actually invented by the Mitanni, uh, who were a people in like uh, northern Syria, Iraq. And then they basically talked to the Egyptians and the Egyptians essentially brought down their entire glass technology and almost 
overnight, archaeologically speaking, probably 20 or 30 years, um, that the Egyptians had this full on glass industry that they didn't before. And it was good. Like there was no like building up or learning or experimental stage, which is one of the reasons why they think that glass technology was imported at that point. Um, okay. So any questions about these scarabs so far? No? Let me show you some more funky things. Um, so that's jewelry for the living. Um, scarabs can get pretty darn funky. Um, you will have scarabs that aren't just scarab beetles, but that are just totally inventive. And starting in the New Kingdom and 18th Dynasty, you actually have scarabs with like human heads or duck heads or all sorts of weird things. And we at Rafma have this one scarab. Um, it's really big. It is so strange. I really don't know what to think about this. So if you happen to be using this presentation for a term paper, do not quote me on this part. <laughs> anyway, um, on the bottom side, you see a number of shoe feathers, which is normal. It's a symbol of, you know, or mott feathers, excuse me, a symbol of order and protection. We got a couple of little hieroglyphs that are hard to read, but this thing is really big and it's made out of clay. Now you can see the scarab back, right? We have the, the suture and the different types of parts, although I guess I didn't go through those parts yet. But instead of having a beetle head, it has a sphinx head. Like, just how crazy is that? And it's made out of, um, it's made out of clay. So it almost looks like somebody took um, dried or not dried leather hard clay and like impressed it almost with like a, a toothpick to to create the face. Um, there's a question: Is that Ramses? I highly doubt it. Um, I, I I wouldn't be able to tell if it was Ramses or not um, because there's no there's no cartouche on it. Um, and then the Sphinx takes on lots of different imagery later on too. So Sphinxes are connected with kings, um, but later on they become a symbol of their own, especially when they're exported to different religions like, you know, Greco-Roman times and things. They become like this almost magical symbol of kingship in general. Um, and sphinxes were used all over the place. This isn't just the great sphinx of Giza, you know, the entire way between Karnak and Luxor of three miles was lined with sphinxes that was probably, uh, that now are from Pharaoh Nectanebo, so something like uh, 6, 700 BC, but might have even had earlier precursors of like Hatshepsut or, two, or Amenhotep III on them. I honestly have no idea what this is. Um, and honestly, like this clay is weird. There's a small break in his head. I, I don't know what to make out of this. I'm going to have to talk to a ceramicist in, in, who does Egyptian ceramics, but the ceramic, the, the actual clay, like this is the mold, right? This is definitely clay from Egypt. And this, I don't know. I'm not a ceramicist. I don't want to say anything, but it doesn't look right. So I'm wondering if this is like, marl clay or if this is clay from a different country and maybe this could have been an, uh, 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 an export that would have been made in you know elsewhere scarabs were so important in egypt that um people around the rest of the mediterranean world also use scarabs they were found throughout all of um like uh israel palestine syria area uh, the ancient Levant, they're found in Crete, they're found, the Romans exported scarabs. So if it's later, it wouldn't be strange for it to also be found abroad too, because scarabs were such a poignant symbol in Egypt that they just continued on and on into the rest of the world. So really, this one is just a giant weird mystery to me. I don't, I, I don't know what to make of it, um, but it's fun. I can tell it was hand molded, um, hand modeled. The bottom was probably pushed into something. Okay. At that size, could it have been a baby toy of some sort? Maybe. Um, actually, they did make toys out of clay. Um, and we have a bunch of these from Lahoon and in houses of others, other places. Um, and so, yeah, you can make 
things out of mud and have them hard dry. Um, at that point, most toys that we found usually aren't fired. So what you would, fired clay, right? Like you'd make the thing out of clay, you form like this ugly little hippo, a very cute little hippo, and then you just keep it in the sun until it was totally dry, then you'd let your kid play with it. Um, they are also sometimes connected to domestic religion. So not every, you know, ugly hippo that you find in a house has to be a toy either. So really, I don't know. Um, and that's just the problem. We don't know the provenance of the, the Sphinx clay. I, we would have to like get a ceramicist and do some petrographic analysis on that. Um, which, yeah, that, that would be fun to do, <laughs> but I don't know where it's is from. Um, and there isn't records of it in the database, unfortunately. Okay, so we have 10 minutes left. Um, I can either go on and tell you more cool things about how scares were used for administration, um, or if you have any questions, you can just tell me. Um, feel free to type them in. Until then, so scarabs like this, the small scarabs that were used for jewelry weren't just used for jewelry in particular. Um, but during the Middle Kingdom especially, and unfortunately we don't have any examples, a person would actually have their name and title written on the bottom of it. And this was vitally important because it wasn't just a symbol of them. It was a way that they would mark their administration. Um, and so so what people would do is they didn't have ancient Egyptian locks on doors. They weren't locks at this point. Um, and so they would essentially put a little piece of um, rope around a lock and they put on a piece of mud and then the person would take their name and their title and they would stamp it onto that piece of mud as this um, symbol of them. Yeah, and so this is exactly what it is. It's kind of like using their names and titles as their signature. So they would know if it was broken and whose fault it was or who should have been overseeing it. And this is really cool for archaeologists um, because, um, because you can actually take these pieces of mud that are very often just pieces of trash, so they, they end up laying on the ground where they broke off, right? Um, and be able to see which administrator was doing what in different areas and actually trace administration around full sites based on these broken pieces of ceiling garbage. And that's one of the reasons why the, the image um, on the earlier slide was a scarab as a ring, because people would actually use them as signet rings and like sign things with them too. They're very important symbols. Um, Okay, so I wanna go back to that question from before about uh, Tati Usur. Um, and Brian Kramer, are you in the audience? Can you turn off your microphone and answer that question? Um, so Brian Kramer is the uh, curator who mm -hmm. is in charge of um, the collection at RAFMA. And he is the one that I was actually researching um, researching this particular coffin and discovered that it was a, a woman instead of a man based on the name um, in it. And I'm wondering if you have the ability to answer that question, Brian. Are you out there? Oh, no, it's the other way around. It, she has a woman's name and yet she's called the son of her parents. And so there was back and forth about what went wrong with that writing. <laughs> and so the initial idea was maybe this name her name is very close to a, man, a man's name. The difference is only one letter and the letter is done with one pen stroke. So maybe that pen stroke was wrong or maybe the name was given at, or maybe it was incorrectly given as a son as opposed to a daughter. And uh, so the first thought was the initial was initially that the pen stroke was wrong and it was actually a man's name. But then we found, I found lots of other parallels for people who are women who are called son of so-and-so in the third intermediate period. So I think it's easier to just assume that the scribe didn't mess up the name, which is the most important part, and then messed up the attribution of it as the son as opposed to the daughter. So that's where we're at with that. Yeah. Thank you very much for answering that one. Uh, uh, yeah. 
Okay, um, so there is another question that Susan asked. It says, I would note that Anubis is closely related to royalty from the early dynastic period. Um, and, and that is partially true. Uh, in the early dynastic period, and especially in the first dynasty, you have uh, a jackal-headed god named Wawet that you especially get around the um, royal tombs, specifically at Abydos. And they are kind of connected to Anubis later on, but it's the same idea. It's a jackal-headed god that protected cemeteries. Okay, so um, I would note that Anubis is closely related to royalty from the early dynastic period, and the Cleopatra beetle is found on artifacts dating to the first uh, dynastic period related to the goddess theme. Okay, so yes, yeah, so very, very early uh, in the first dynasty, um, we have images of jackals protecting cemeteries. That is something that is um, fairly, here we go, let's bring that back up again, fairly standard. And we even see in the seal impressions of like the necropolis seal from Abydos, where you have the god, the jackal god Wepwawet, um, and he is protecting the whole area. One of the most important women from the first dynasty um, was a woman by the name of Merenith. And there's a great debate as to whether or not she um, is just the mother of a king or if she might have been a king herself or basically acted as regent for a kid that was a king and was too young to actually do anything. But regardless, she was very important because she was actually given a royal tomb in the Abydos area. And so you do have this bringing in of um, Merenith in that particular area too. Do I have any other questions, Miranda? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, can they all see this? Okay. Okay, so it's modern. <laughs> That's why it looks weird. Okay, so thank you to Diego, who went into the archives of the museum and said that this is a 20th century tourist piece. And that makes so much more sense to me. <laughs> okay, um, so yeah, so that when this, this was probably one of the things that people made for tourists a hundred years ago in Egypt. And it makes sense, right? Like you can make this type of thing quickly and sell it to people and it's mixing those types of motifs, which is why it is very, very strange. Um, yes, <laughs> thank you. That is hilarious. Um, I, I agree. So, you know, always do your homework, look up what's actually in the archives. Uh, that has hidden information too. So, yeah. Are there any other final questions? Um, no. Well, with that being said, um, I would encourage you guys all, number one, please get on the Rathma listserv. We, even though this is the end of our current season, we are going to be doing really cool things all next year with lots of different presentations. So if you're on the listserv, you'll be able to learn about those. Um, and if you have a kid, grandkid, grandnephew that is interested in Egypt, point them to Kids Discover Egypt. Also go through our archives and check out some very cool things that Rafma has been doing over this last year. Um, this last year in the pandemic, they have just put up unbelievable amounts of um, uh, videos and talks and uh, they have a matter port for the collection and I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say this yet but they're also creating a very cool 3D model of the whole collection that hopefully will be up and running very soon um, and uh, you know I credit the whole Rathma crew who has been working diligently on that this whole time uh, definitely check out the Rathma YouTube channel um, and let's see, there was one more quick question that came in. It says, were scarabs ever used as money? Um, the answer is no. Uh, so money is everything in Egypt, uh, as far as the economy goes, was done on trade. Um, but that doesn't mean just like willy nilly, you know, I'll trade you a, a scarab for, you know, uh, a shoe or something like that. They had a standard type of value. And so basically everything was related down to what's called the Deben, 
um, which is a amount of, uh, of metal, usually copper, but it could also be a different type of metal too. So they would know, oh, my scarabs cost a half Devon and my shoes cost 16 Devon. So, you know, they would then do an equivalent trade. We finally get in money around 500 BC when mercenaries are insisted on being paid in it um, because people in other countries have finally invented coin money after that, which has a lot of great benefits anyway. Um, so uh, without any other questions, okay, so we're also being asked if there will be a recording of this lecture. Is it being recorded? Yes, it will be up on the YouTube channel shortly, probably within a couple of days. Um, after they, you know, edit out certain sections. And, no, it'll be great. It'll be fun. <laughs> um, but really, too, thank you all for coming. Um, it will be available in a couple days. Uh, definitely check out our YouTube channel. They have, they've been doing some very awesome things at this museum and share it with your friends. So, ta-ta for now. Enjoy your tequila sunrise.